Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young, and it's another day in the college sports world, which means another player is in the transfer portal. Uh, Arthur Kaluma is in, and this is one that has kind of been an interesting follow because he's going to go through the NBA draft process, so there was already the chance that he wouldn't come back to K-State uh, regardless, which at the end of the day, my opinion has always been for Arthur Kaluma that if he came back to K-State, that's a win for K-State and like a really good thing for them. I don't really know how it benefits Arthur Kaluma outside of, yeah, maybe you're trying to reap in NIL money because I don't think there's anything Arthur Kaluma is going to be able to accomplish of getting better as a basketball player that elevates or lowers his NBA draft stock, which I don't know that there's a ton to begin with, but like whatever perks you would have to starting a pro career, I don't know that you add to it with another year of college basketball. So I always thought, hey, Kaluma coming back is a luxury for K-State. I don't know that it makes sense for him, but him entering the transfer portal on the final day that players are able to kind of adds an interesting wrinkle to this process. Yeah, and I would agree with you. I, I you know, I, To be honest, I think entering the transfer portal is probably less – conducive to him as well than even staying at Kansas State because now he has to start over somewhere else. And I don't know if that's an ideal spot unless he finds an ideal spot. He may. Who knows? I think, I think you have to transfer down, essentially. Not necessarily to like, you know, a, a group of five school, but if you're Arthur well, Kaluma, you, you got to go play at like an Arizona State or an Oklahoma State where they're not very good and you can just go be the guy, you know? Yeah, or, or go to a school that was in a similar spot that K-State was in last year that has high aspirations, but maybe just needs that one extra piece to the puzzle. Now it didn't work out for Kansas State, but that was the thought all along. I think that's possible. I've had my qualms with, with Kaluma, obviously some of that tied to seemingly effort in a few games in the, you know, the, the caring factor. Uh, I think that's a little bit tough to judge. So I might be rushing to conclusions on some of that. I don't know. Um, but you know, there was times where I was less enthused about what he was doing. But at the end of the day, and I wrote this, you know, unfortunately, right before he entered the transfer portal about, you know, reactions to him entering the NBA draft processes, that I think some of the holes in his game became even more visible during this one year at K-State. Um, just from the, you know, the the ball can get sticky in his hands and and the fact that it takes, you know, quite a while for him to get a shot off. Those two things really stand, stand out. His two point shooting numbers were down. His turnover numbers were, you know, considerably up, but at the same time, and this is like why it's really hard to quantify Arthur Kaluma and to, to discuss him because you on the flip side, you have to think about it this way too. He was better from the three point line. He did average more assist. He did average more rebounds. He did average more steals. He did play more minutes. He did score more points. He did get to the free throw line more, and he did shoot better from the free throw line. So in many of the ways that you want to quantify his performance while at Manhattan did get significantly better than his prior two years at Creighton, and maybe that's a, a credit to Jerome Tang and his coaching staff for what they were able to do with someone with that skill set that wants to enhance his career, probably what, you know, you got to think about what they did with Keontae Johnson, Marquise Noel at the same time, two guys that saw them themselves, you know, enter the stratosphere from a performance standpoint compared to what they had done prior to uh, becoming, being at Kansas State and what they probably still sold Doug McDaniel to get into K-State, what they're probably trying to sell to, to Khalif Battle, um, the transfer from Arkansas. So those things also go into the picture. Um, but at the end of the day, and I don't think this is a, you know, a secret by any means. It, it's basically what happens. I think in every one of these decisions, he basically said, "I'll come back for maybe for a certain number." And you know what? Teams are going to say, "Yes, you're worth that," or "No, you're not," and they're not going to agree on it. And and then you get a decision like this. So, uh, it happening hours before the transfer portal closing too is a, an interesting strategy on Kaluma's part, I am sure as well. Yeah, that's that's the other fascinating part. And honestly, at the end of the day, like this is not a fault of Arthur Kaluma. I think or in, the staff. in, in yep. totality, yeah, I think 
this is one of those deals where both sides look at it and you have to tip your cap to Arthur Kaluma and say, this is good business on his part. Like you have an opportunity here. If you think you need to do something different, uh, whether that be an NIL side or what your role would be on a team in college basketball next year, then you should absolutely go and try and maximize it. That is what Arthur Kaluma should care about. The staff, they obviously would have probably liked to have had him back, but at the end of the day, this staff, they're not a bunch of idiots. Like they're not, and they're not horrible people. They understand, like, hey, you got to go do what you got to do. It sucks for us, but we get it. And they're also immersed in the transfer market right now. They know what pl- players like him are likely commanding. So I assume, you know, they know what's about to come for him more than he does. So based on what he was essentially asking, I imagine, could be wrong. They could be wrong. I could be wrong. Is that he's probably not going to get what he thinks. And, and that's what it comes back to what we were talking just before we got, we started recording this, right? And, and you essentially hit the nail on the head, too, in my opinion, with your description of it is that in some ways, the people guiding these kids towards these decisions or trying to convince them of a certain decision, and it was always going to happen when NIL became legal, so to speak, not essentially what it is now, uh, pay for play. I don't think that was the intention, but everyone knew was going to be the intention. You're going to have people that be, that are predatory. Yeah. Predatory is the, the word that, that I've been using the last couple of days to describe it. Because I think if you look at it, the role of an agent, yes, they always want to get theirs, no matter the level, no matter what you're working with. But, you know, in the NBA and the NFL, they, the best interest of their player is also to get as much money as possible for the most part, unless that player specifically says, Hey, look, you know, legacy wise, I'll take a little less to go and do this. But for the most part, the player getting a hundred million dollars instead of $80 million is a good thing. That's also good for the agent in college sports and basketball and football specifically, where this is the biggest of deals. It isn't always, you know, Hey, what I can make as a sophomore is what's in the best interest of me because in all honesty, you're probably still needing to develop and your development as a sophomore could parlay yourself into getting more money down the road than just trying to, you know, take the highest offer year after year. Like I would, I would venture to say, and and we don't know what the ins and outs of the day to aim situation are. I'm sure he thought that uh, he was going to be lacking playing time. I don't know that that would have actually been the case, but my guess is, and especially since we saw that the person that, you know, gave the news up was his NIL agent. I think these NIL agents are, they're not really in it for these guys. They're trying to get as much money as they can get. And that is the only thing they care about. Not the fact that, hey, maybe Day Day Ames staying at K-State for another year, developing there, can send him up into a different stratosphere after this. Now you'll see what you end up getting, and it's probably a, a highest bidder type of situation. And, you know, I, I thought you you also kind of hit it when you were we were talking about it beforehand, and you just said, hey, look, these agents, they're going to be shifting guys around to help themselves out too, where it's, hey, if I can get this guy here, he gets, you know, um, a $50,000, $100,000 pay bump in his NIL. That's a better cut for me. And now I've got this guy. He's a little stud coming from a Missouri Valley school. I'm going to bump him up. He's going to go play in the Big Ten now. And that's more money for me. It's it's all golden. And that I think that's the real intricacies of all of this that people probably aren't fully aware of or haven't considered and if you spent some time thinking about it it would all make a lot of sense and and the and these players and, and the people in their corners don't understand all those intricacies and and that's the the tough nature of all of this and you know to, to describe that more in depth is an agent is representing more than just one player he might be representing 10 players if i can give my big 10 player to this acc school like you said i can get my missouri valley player to this big 10 school, I can give my so-and-so to this Missouri, you know, he's can, he's in it for himself. He's thinking I can do this to the, my player here because it helps out my other player win, win. Um, everyone's got to take those things into consideration. And I guess we can kind of go full circle here of what the gist of what we wanted to talk about. And I've been saying that is more important to regulate the transfer portal rather than NIL. Um, they, they probably go hand in hand, let's be honest. So, but I think 
Does college basketball have a transfer portal problem? It, it's nuanced. The transfer portal is not a problem, and it does good for the sport because in the past, I don't think our website's getting as many hits, as many views, as much interest in April and May as it does now, and that's mostly because of the basketball transfer portal and other and the football transfer portal, quite honestly, at the same time. Those things are good. You're creating year-round interest, intrigue, and entertainment in a sport that was probably lacking that to an extent, um, especially basketball because there are far fewer players when you're just talking high school recruiting. You're going to sign two to four kids. Um, that doesn't take a full off season. So the, it's good in that way. It's bad in what we're talking about here is that, and we can go look at this, and I'm sure it's so many schools are going to have such different rosters year to year. And that doesn't even happen in professional sports. And, you know, someone's like, well, what's the big deal if you get better? Well, and, and most and that that's a good question. And maybe it isn't, but you're not going to guarantee that you get better every year. So that's the solution isn't say, oh, we get better because you're gonna get better. Like kids they got better two years well, ago, they didn't get better last year. And you and that's the thing, you have to do it like this is why I'm starting to get on board with the people that think that there is a problem and I, I can start to see a path to where I, I join them in saying, Hey, it's tougher for me to follow and enjoy college sports or even more specifically for some K state because I like it's it's a totally different crew from last year. I mean here here's the current basketball roster at K state right now. They have three players that played on the team last season at the current moment that are on it. They two, still have five open spots that needed to be added. And only two of those were on the Elite 8 team. Yeah. So that I mean you you have two players that have been here for two years going into a third with K state. And my, my thought process with this ends up being is that I think you have to give a staff time when there are new staff and in this world to kind of establish themselves. And it takes time to build that roster consistency where, you know, year one, it's do whatever you can to try and put yourself in a decent position. Obviously Jerome Tang did that and it, it was really good. It sent them in a good direction then because of that, though, year two was always going to be hit and miss because you were kind of building the same thing on the fly. I think this year you would have hoped that you had a little bit more consistency, but you've been around longer. You have a little more cachet. You can kind of build things up. And what I think is a key into making this all kind of settle down for people and fans is look at what K-State's brought in in the transfer portal. Bayfall has three years of eligibility left. Brendan Housen, C.J. Jones, and Doug McDaniel – all going to be juniors. They have two years left to play. That, I think, is one of the key things that with how much is being built on a roster in the transfer portal now is getting those guys that have multiple years of eligibility. David Gasson, a great example of it, came to K-State, had three years left to play. He's going to use all three. I think we're seeing this at like Iowa State where the first couple of years, Otzelberger did not have roster consistency like None of those guys look the same as the team that you saw the year before. But now as he's getting ready to head into his fourth year after three full seasons, there is some of that roster consistency because you get the transfer portal guys that have multiple years available to them and you're able to establish your high school recruiting a little bit more. I think that's important moving forward. But if K-State's not able to do that after this coming season, then I do start to wonder what is the point of any of this? Yeah, because they tried it the first time, probably to an extent, right? Too, you had Quez Glover. Um, he's in the portal, um, unfortunately, and we know what happened with Naquan Tomlin. Arthur Kaluma had multiple years. He just went back in the portal. Cam Carter multiple years back in the portal. Jarrell Colbert multiple years back in the portal. Um, and and in most of those cases, it's because of guys they went and got other guys in the portal. It's because it's so easy to do it, like right um, that. And my problem isn't – you talked about it from more of a roster standpoint, and it's absolutely correct. And But my problem is this. A lot of those fans that are 11,000 fans in Bramlage Coliseum to go up and sell that place out, 
on just about every conference game and, you know, a handful of non-conference games. They know players on the team from the year before, and that gets the intrigue building too. They don't follow the transfer portal. Some of them, a lot of them, probably don't follow the transfer portal as much as people on KSO. So now you're asking them to get excited for people they don't know. And I think that's an issue if that happens every single year. It's going to be hard for a fan to say, I love K-State. I'm so excited year after year when it's just nine or ten new paid mercenaries every year. And that's not Jerome Tang's fault. That's not these players' fault. That's the NCAA's fault for just throwing their hands up and not putting together a system that would kind of hone a lot of this in. I don't have the answers of how to regulate the transfer portal. And quite frankly, until they collectively bargain and allow the athletes at the table, right, to come up or the representatives at the table to come up with a better solution, the courts are going to say, you're shit out of luck anyway. Yeah, that that's the, the problem here is that this whole thing, when it essentially went into effect, uh, what that would have been the, the summer of 2022, uh, it, it, overnight, everything changed, and all these people had to scramble because the NCAA, for years, did not want to give an inch on this stuff. When, like, it, it could have been the simplest of things. It's like, hey, Jacob Pullen is a really good basketball player at K State. They are selling jerseys with the number zero on them. Jacob Pullen should get a cut of that money. Put his name on the back. Give him a cut of the money. Hey, EA Sports is making a video game. Give Colin Klein a cut of that money. You know, like give these guys a cut of that money and find other ways. Like you're in a college town. They should have always been able to have done a TV commercial for whoever in Manhattan or whatever it may be. Like it's silly that the NCAA never gave in on that because now what you have is exactly what the NCAA was really trying to protect. And it's essentially the pay for play type of stuff. Like it's not hyperbole when people say that, you know, all the stuff that people were doing under the table is legal now. It's very true. And the NCAA can't do anything to stop it because if you don't give an inch, eventually you're going to have to give a mile whether you like it or not. And now you can't you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Like, it's all out there. And I think, honestly, the way that this ends up going is it's all going to have to regulate itself, and that's going to take time. Like, we're going to have to get deeper into the weeds. Things are going to have to get a whole lot worse with the portal and NIL situation for things to start to regulate where I think honestly it gets to the point where, you know, like 20 or 30 years from now it's okay. You know what? Like this is ridiculous that we're paying these guys. Like let's just go back to saying we're not going to pay them. And if, you know, they want to go make money elsewhere, whatever, but as college, as college athletic programs, we are not going to do this anymore. And it would all reset itself because at the end of the day, even if the talent is slightly lesser, I've always said that no matter who's in that uniform, as long as it says K-State on the chest, K-State fans are going to watch it because it's your school. You like the way they're represented. But you still have to be at the highest level. You have to still do all these other things. I just think it's going to take that, and then that way you get some of that consistency that comes into it because what I just said there, I have to seriously question that if you know next season we're looking at – I mean, we could probably track it, but over the last – the first three, four seasons of Jerome Tang, say we end next season, you bring in a new wave. There's going to have been like 50 different players that have been on a roster at K-State under Jerome Tang, and he's only going to have been here for four years. Like, that's just insane to think about. That's not how this should be, and I can see how that would alienate people. And it's like what you said. Like, people go to KSO. The people on KSO – are aware of this for the most part, but sometimes it happens so fast. There's so many of them that you could be somebody that logs on to KSO every day and still feel like you're left out of the loop. Like that's how crazy this can be at times. And then you think, okay, you know, 50,000 people get into Bill Snyder family stadium. A small percentage of that are on KSO. I mean, it feels like a lot to people that are in that bubble, but you step out of it and the common fan that's showing up every Saturday in Manhattan they're not on KSO all the time. They don't know what's going on. They're like, that's where it's tough to get these people all the way bought in. Like, my mom is going to have zero clue next year who's on K State's basketball roster. She will probably still at some point ask if Marquise Noel is on the team. Like, 
I don't think she's that out of touch, but like stuff like that will happen. And they'll be wildly confused when you go, well, actually, like that guy was at Michigan last year. That guy was at Arkansas. This guy was at some tiny school in Chicago. Like all this. And be, what? Like what? Where's Kaluma? Where's Day Day Ames? Like all these guys. So I think that you're teetering on having this problem. And I really think that it just depends on how well equipped your coaching staff is, how well equipped your NIL department is, and all these other things that can try and work their hardest to get roster consistency. And even that may not work out. And if it doesn't, then it really is going to start to disenfranchise people. And I think this is a unique problem to college basketball that college football will not have. I think you and I and Drew, we've talked about it within the last week. Football has always been such a developmental sport at every level. You know, you're a freshman in high school. You're not playing varsity football in most cases. You understand it's going to take a year or two before you do that. Basketball has always been, if you've got the skill and you're the best, you're on the floor, we're using you no matter your age. And that's the expectation these guys have coming into school. So they think, I need to be on the floor and I need to be getting paid. And that just isn't how the college game works uh, developmentally. And unfortunately, it's led to a lot of roster turnover. There just there just needs to be a compromise found at some point because the the player movement is fair and it adds excitement and entertainment to the off season of ways that you can enhance your roster. Too much to where you have a completely different roster year in and year out. It's, I just think over time, that's not a sustainable model for continued fan interest. I, 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 and I could be wrong, but if you just trot out 10 or 11 new players of your 13 every single year, and again, I'm not blaming Jerome Tang for this. I'm not blaming the basketball staff for this. I'm blaming the system that is in place because it's impossible to keep your – it's impossible to – Fill your final spots on your roster without alienating the ones that originally intend to stay. It's That's the issue right now. And everyone also thinks that they're entitled to a certain NIL figure without understanding true value. There, there's a lot of broken pieces. And I and I get a little worried looking you know, into the future if it's still like this for – one, two, three, four more years without fixing some of those broken pieces that, like you said, they are going to be some that are disenfranchised enough that fall out. And we'll put it this way. And if you're spending, and maybe this is a good, maybe self-correction issue, like Jerome Tang says, we need this, we need this to field a Final Four roster. And then for some reason, it you, you get all that and you – let's say you fall short, well short of expectations. I don't think that's going to happen. Well short of expectations. Then what's the fatigue and the hesitation from those that gave you all yeah. that? Again, it's, 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 a, it's a world right now that's not very navigable. And uh, just from all the people that contribute to it, I don't think it's sustainable for them. And I don't know that it's, conducive to the fan experience either yeah and i, I don't think this is just a a k-state problem or no, people blow this like the the ku's in north carolina's of the world they will they will go through this too i mean I, you just did. Yeah, we're seeing it right now with with ku like they're bringing in freshmen they're gone after a year it's like well you'd like them to stay and develop especially because like i mean how many times has that guy that has stayed at ku under bill self by his junior year turn into something really good. Like it's happened a lot, but like it just can't happen. So everybody's dealing with this. And they it's like keep what, a high school commi- they couldn't keep a high school signing. They lost yeah. LeBaron Filin or whatever you say yeah. his name. He asked out of his letter of intent, says, I'm not doing this. And, and it's it's kind of like what you're saying and and how you you kind of view this. Like you have to be able to win and sustain the winning, but like it's got to come at a high level. Like you can't have this roster turnover every year to be 19 and 15 and play in the NIT. Like you can't have that every season and you have to keep building off of it. It's got to sustain. Like I have no doubt that if the team that goes out there and they're overturning the roster every year, but they're making deep runs in the NCAA tournament, they're winning conference titles, they're going to final fours. 
the, those fan bases are still going to have fun and dedicate the time to pay attention to it because it's important to them. But if you can't be at that high level consistently and keep elevating yourself, then it will be easier for people to check out and just say, you know what? There's no point to this. Basketball already gets less attention to football. Like that's where all of my eggs are going to. I'll put them in that basket. And, you know, basketball truly becomes a hobby sport for people. And, and that's, that's just not where you want to go. And I, I think, I think K-State is as well-equipped as one can be with the staff that they have in place right now with Jerome Tang and obviously the support that he's getting. But even Jerome Tang, as we're seeing with how things set up, like the best of the best coaches out there cannot withstand this as long as they, they you would want them to and think they could. Yeah, he said that he wanted to finalize his roster at so and so time. I think it was probably at some I'm point. Probably by like today, I think was yeah, it would have been the seven point, week period. It yeah. was essentially seven at day. some point at some point this week, and they were probably on pace to do that. But let's look at it this way. I don't think he expected to lose all seven of Jarrell Colbert, Cam Carter, Dorian Finister, RJ Jones, Quez Glover, Day Day Ames, and Arthur Kaluma. Now, if you don't lose all seven of those. Yeah, you're probably close to finalizing the roster. That's why it's impossible to roster manage right now. You can't add people without pissing off one of those seven. Yeah, no doubt about it. We'll see how it goes. But I just uh, I think it's one of those problems that has to be – I don't know that it's ha- going to be figured out. You would like for it to be. But I do think at some point, like you talk about, the transfer portal probably needs those regulations. I think you're probably right because I think if you regulate the portal – it regulates NIL in some ways, or at the end of the day, honestly, it lessens the impact that NIL has in all this. Like if, if you can find a way to lock this in, and that's probably the next place that the NCAA needs to go is that when it does get to the point of saying that the schools can directly make a contract or give the money, which is, I think probably where we have to go for all this to somewhat get better. I know people will push back on wanting that to be the case, but being able to lock somebody in and say, no, you're here two years. You were here for two years, and the only out is if we want out. And I think and that, that's and probably that, where this That requires going. probably some sort of collective bargaining agreement because then you're you're really talking what pro sports are. Because pro sports, they don't have this kind of player movement either. It's just not rational. Um, but, but it's funny because at this point, the way to defend yourself and prevent this stuff from happening – like, right, so-and-so leaving that you want to keep because you want to take this guy is basically, and this is what is stupid about this, I need scrubs for my 11th, 12th, and 13th player that nobody's freaking scared of on my own roster. Pretty much, yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. You you basically need to just walk down the street and load up on guys that that were would be playing at a Division three school or NAIA school right now and say, you're going to be the end of our bench. You will never play. You're not going to get a dime of NIL, but you get to go to school for free. And 10 years from now, tell people you played basketball in the Big 12 because that's probably the best way for this thing to to kind of work out right now. And also, I think the, the ultimate solution is just kind of you're going to have to do some of the things you don't want to do to, to reel this in if you're the NCAA, but I think they're probably pretty spineless at this point, and uh, I, I don't know where, where this goes. I mean, the, and that sounds like probably much more like uh, disastrous thoughts than, than what will ultimately happen, but I do think it will cause a problem with people's interest in the game, and uh, this probably is a, a bigger issue right now for K-State because this is really the first time that you're having to come to grips with it and figuring it out. So we'll see where it goes from here and uh, what's next up for K-State as they now still have those five spots to fill, and it doesn't appear that Arthur Kaluma would be one of the ones that could fill it in. So uh, Jerome Tang did say that he wanted to have the roster done pretty soon. That doesn't seem like it's going to happen because of all the changes going on. But in your eyes, D.Y., how quickly do you think you know that number of open scholarships could drop down to – you know, three or something. You know, in the next week, I would imagine instead of five spots left, maybe there's two or three. You're right. That's what I would do. I like it. the original plan was probably done by the end of this week. And if they hadn't lost some of the guys they expected to keep, maybe that would have happened. Yeah. We'll see how it ends up going for K-State, but there it is. It's the current guys on the team and uh, where things go from there. Ultimately though, like you can, 
I, if they add two more guys, two of the right guys, I don't think you need to worry about there being three open spots because, like we've talked about, the end of your bench here, <laughs> you really don't want it to be all that talented or anything. So maybe having empty spots is good moving forward next year. Uh, yeah, in a way, and, and that's the unfortunate part of all of this and how we're, we have to frame it, right? I mean, that shouldn't ever be the case. Um, for those panicking a little bit, it's like five spots left at this point. That's a lot. It's May 1st. Um, I, I don't know if Tyler Perry was even committed by now. Arthur Kluma definitely wasn't. That's, uh, you know, not every year is comparable to the next year, I know. And one thing I will say about the guys that they do have, I, like everyone's excited about Doug McDaniel. We know David Gasson for what he is asked to do. He is a dude, in my opinion. And then I think, and I could be totally off because this thing still has to play out, I know. But I think – we're probably not putting enough value on what CJ Jones will ultimately give Kansas State as well. Uh, it was exactly 365 days ago that Tyler Perry committed to K State, and he so, was the first transfer portal commit at that time. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, last year it was like, uh, are they going to get anybody ever? And they they eventually did, but we'll see how and, it goes. And, and and for those freaking out about the five, um, I'll try to frame it this way too. The team that made the Elite Eight had Marquise Noel, point guard. This team is Doug McDaniel. I think – I'm not saying they're exact same players, but Doug McDaniel is really good, right, in my opinion. That team also had basically – well, had Naquan Tomlin. I don't know that you have a Naquan Tomlin yet or, or someone that – maybe Bob Miller is that. That team at the five started David Gasson. He's still on the roster. And the backup was Bebe Igiola at the five on a team that went to the Elite Eight as well. So – for those that are like, well, Bay Falls just a throwaway. I think I would take Bay, this Bay Falls still, and now he he still has a ways to go. He didn't play much or at all really last year, but still, could, the ceiling on what he's going to do in year two is probably more than the ceiling on what Bay Bay Igiola gave you on an <laughs> elite eight team. What I am saying is, there's still pieces left on the board and pieces that you already got to assemble a comparable roster to that one in my opinion yep no doubt about it there are still uh, plenty of options out there and certainly ones that k-state is dialed in on we'll have all the updates on the basketball transfer portal for you over at kstateonline.com also plenty of stuff with the football portal as k-state has added quite a few different players over the last couple of days uh, guys that will immediately impact them as well so all the k-state coverage you want at kstateonline.com find us at on three or right here on the KSO YouTube and podcast. So we will be out of here, back again tomorrow on Thursday with some more news and notes on the Cats. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Both. Thanks for watching the KSO Show.